welcome to another edition of the Reconciliation Conversation podcast. Uh, as always, we want this to be a space where we can expose hate, encourage love, equip for healthy reconciliation, and emphasize unity so that all people, no matter where they are, where they're coming from, can know their value together as one. My name is Derek Delane, and I'm here with the OG, Jason Dukes. What's up, man? I, that may be my favorite compliment or favorite name that you've given me so far. I appreciate I'll, that. Listen, uh, for, for those that don't know what an OG is, the original gangster is, is Jason. So listen, I'm, I'm thankful that we could do this together, bro. Well, this, uh, this type of interview is, is, is a first one for us and where we don't uh, just get the thoughts of, of one individual. We actually get two. Uh, yep. So I'm excited to introduce these two brothers today. Um, our first guest joining us is, is EJ Gaines. He's married to his wife, Janice, who is a recording artist and speaker. They have two sons. EJ is the co-executive director of Motown Gospel and VP of Marketing uh, for Capital Christian Music Group. He's pra uh, practiced law since 2007. He went to NYU for his undergrad, then St. John's University, Go Red Storm, uh, the school of law up there. And alongside EJ, I also want to introduce Todd Smith. Uh, Todd is, is married to his wife, Angie, who is an author and speaker. They have five children. Uh, Todd is a lead singer of the group Sela and an avid Michigan fan. Todd, listen, if nobody blue, else baby. said it to you, listen, if no one <laughs> has said this to you, let me just say I'm sorry that Isaiah Todd decided to go to the G League, man. I am so sorry about that. <laughs> I, 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 I feel the empathy in your voice and I appreciate that. And um, yeah, you know, we just, we just, we've struggled for a long time. So ever since yeah. that school in North Carolina, that division two school we played, we've just never really recovered. So <laughs> it's been hard. Oh, man. It's, there was it's, a timeout involved, happens. if I remember right. But, uh, well, if that was the other North Carolina school. Yeah, that was it's so funny. <laughs> funny thing, Chris Weber, if I would have played at my basketball in eighth grade, uh -huh. uh, I would have played against Chris Weber. And mm -hmm. he was dunking over the guys in my, on my team uh, wow. in eighth grade. Yeah. And then he went to school a mile away from me. And I used to go watch him like freshman, sophomore year. Like he, he'd win the state championship every year. He was unbelievable. But yeah, that time wow. out, that was painful. And then yeah. North Carolina, we played, what's the school in Carolina? We played them in football. We were number five in the country, and they Appalachian blocked the kick. Yeah, that, yeah. Appalachian don't even State. say the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ever since then, our football team has never recovered. So listen, listen, Todd. Todd's not bitter at all. So <laughs> not at all. We're, we're thankful that you could you could be here with us uh, as as well, man. Well, listen, uh, I'm glad you guys joined us in in this uh, the reconciliation conversation. Uh, and personally, I'm excited to get you guys' perspective today um, as artists, as those that, that work with and around artists. I think this perspective uh, is going to be really good to, to hear um, as we just continue on in this, this conversation. So, um, EJ, man, I, I want to jump in with you, if, if you're cool with that, bro. Yeah. Um, so, so thinking back over, over the years when it comes to just, just racial tension in our country, especially kind of where we are right now, um, how would you describe what you've seen and, and heard uh, as a leader in the music industry, both historically in our culture, um, as well as the music industry uh, as, as a whole? Mm. Um, well, you know, the music industry is really just a microcosm of the world. You know, it's a snapshot of what's going on. And so it has the same, the same problems, the same frustrations um, as we would see in any industry. Um, but it's probably intensified a little bit um, through this idea of borrowing slash inspiration slash appropriation. Um, mm. By and large in music, um, you know, I saw an infographic on online the other day that talked about African American music coming from 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 the slave uh, slave days all the way up until modern day and just its influence, the influence of, of black American music on all mm -hmm. musical forms. And yeah. that, that thread being kind of consistent through the music industry and the industry that makes billions and billions of dollars off of that inspiration, you know, that spark mm -hmm. of inspiration as it affected rock and roll, as it affected jazz, as, as it affected um, country music. I mean, just all these different genres that um, are now segregated and segmented um, but having this influence, um, 
it, it's just a snapshot of a larger conversation that's happening across the world. You know, I mean, you look at mm -hmm. sports and you look at athletes and the effect or the influence of, you know, looking at the last dance and watching the influence of Michael Jordan on the entire sport or looking mm -hmm. at Tiger Woods and how iconic he was uh, or Venus Williams and how iconic she's been. And we see these, um, these consistent patterns of, um, of African-Americans um, contributing in valuable ways, um, sometimes not being acknowledged for those contributions um, and having to claw back or fight for validation, value, um, a sense of appreciation. And that happens in the music industry just like it does in, in regular society and other, in other sectors. Man, that's, that's a good perspective. Um, and uh, something that you said, I was actually talking to, to a friend of mine about the, uh, if you backtrack and just see, you know, a lot of the, the, the slave narratives and, you know, uh, you know, their musical genre, things like that, dripping in into every other musical genre. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times people, people don't talk about that, number one, but number two, people just don't know about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I appreciate you kind of bringing that, uh, bringing that to the, to the table here today. It'll be interesting that. just to note, you know, the the Afri the National Museum for African American Music is opening in Nashville here um, yeah. in um, in this fall, and it's been a long time coming. But the CEO there, um, Henry Beecher Hicks, um, talks about this thread of black music and goes all mm -hmm. the way to rock and roll and talks about how Elvis was um, was influenced um, and 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 things that you know. I love like the Country Music Hall of Fame. They have a section on African American contributions to country music, and like mm -hmm. you said, things that you wouldn't even think. The Ryman, the museum has a has a glass case among other glass cases about the African American contribution, the Fisk Jubilee Singers and their contribution to country music. Well, Fisk mm -hmm. is up the street, you know, and how many yep. country music artists here in Nashville, Music City, understand and appreciate the value of of Negro spirituals in the context of what they're making, you know, when you go down to Bridgestone Arena um, and understand that contribution or taking the time to, and even more, um, have had to take the time to appreciate the value of that contribution, mm -hmm. or have they been able to succeed without ever knowing that information? Yeah, and I think, I think it's that last piece there that is the tension, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that they've been able to succeed without yeah, even knowing. acknowledging, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I would say that, that that, I mean, that speaks to just the, the tension as a whole, going back to, you know, that original piece, man, there's, there's just a lot of unknown um, that, that bleeds into uh, a lot of the issues that, that we're seeing. I appreciate you, your perspective there, EJ. Yeah, thank you. No, that's good. Well, you said a couple of things there that, that brought to mind some things. One was, when I was, I grew up in inner city, New Orleans, and in high school, in our choir, our school choir, we would do a lot of Negro spirituals. One we did was Elijah Rock. So the moment you, the moment you said that, I started singing Elijah Rock in my head. But then Moses last, Hogan, that arranger. Do he was? Was well, Moses? Uh, you know what? I don't. I'm not. I wasn't aware enough at the time to uh, know who wrote it. I was probably thinking about how hot the girl was next to me. But, <laughs> but all all that all that say. The, I don't know who wrote it, but I know we sang it, and it was a lot of fun. So it's a good one. It was a great one. It was a great yeah. one. Uh, but then the other one, too, to your point a while ago, like, you know, we watched Hidden Figures the other night, and it's not the perfect movie to illustrate this, but necessarily, but it does illustrate the point that some of my older kids, as we watched it the other night, you know, we before I hit play, I said to them, hey, I want you to notice what is reality versus mm -hmm. what you thought reality was. Mm, that's good right that's because good. because yeah. because because this is we're going to watch what really brought uh you know glenn to its his place of orbit and back again mm -hmm. um and then what you have always heard right like you've not heard this story and so you're right man that that living in that tension is where we have been and the unawareness finally coming to light I was on a panel discussion last night and the idea of weariness mm. for the black leader came up. Whereas a lot of white leaders right now are going, I'm eager to learn. <laughs> right. And when the mm -hmm. black leader's sitting there and going, where you been? Right. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and so I think that, that tension is just, it, I, I don't understand it and don't want to pretend to understand it. Um, but I, I'm saying, I, I just want to acknowledge that it's there and we need to be, we need to be acknowledging of it. 
Yeah. Let's jump into this question. Thinking about friendship, relationship, you guys have a great friendship from, from everything that Todd said to me. And, um, you know, so, so Todd, you jump in on this one first, but I really want to hear from both of you. Why, why, why do relationships with people whose skin color might be different than ours, whose heritage might be different than ours, why do relationships with like that matter so much? But then secondly, as you, as you answer that, both of you jump in on what are the perceptions and misperceptions that can at least we can become more acknowledging and aware of, as we were just saying, th because we value those kinds of friendships. In other words, it's not just a project. It truly becomes friendship and family. And then we get to really learn how to honor each other and who we really are. Why, why is that so significant? We know it is. But what are some things you've learned over the years that have made it so significant to you? Wow. Um, in particular, so like my best friend, uh, Dan, is Asian. Um, he, his parents are from mainland China. And it was never a thing where we like, we, at first we didn't like each other because he was good friends with a guy I could stand. <laughs> so <laughs> we toured together in a music group called Echoes of Love. Uh, in high school and we've known each other <laughs> since fourth grade but we became best friends my junior year and I think without even realize like we never looked at it as oh I have you know an Asian friend and I have a white friend we were just we loved each other yeah. and we but there's so much of his heritage there's so much of seeing things through his eyes that I would have never known or never understood or didn't even know is there. And as we've entered into these conversations, especially with what's been happening, happening in the African American community, you know, hearing him even push back on me to say, hey, you need to think broader about this, understand this better, dig in better, because you don't know what it's like, you know, and mm -hmm. um, there, there's, I think, just, di you know, having people who have different experiences and different um, what they've grown up with, with EJ in particular, you know, it was during uh, Ferguson that um, I was looking at young black men burning buildings and mm. restaurants and going, this is ridiculous. And why is this happening? And why are those kids doing this? They're just destroying their neighborhoods. And EJ posted on Facebook and he just said, I just need to know, I hope, I, you know, I can coach no, on this uh, EJ, but uh, and it's it's paraphrased, but basically it was, do any of my white friends care? Mm -hmm. I just need to know, do you care? And it was so jarring to me because it was not what I was thinking. I was mm -hmm. thinking, this is how it is. And to hear this man is, I, you know, I, and I, I mean, I, I, I said it in a text to you before, EJ is, as far as a man of character, uh, he, when I, when I look at people I've known over the years, um, and you're going to owe me big for this man, just, oh, you know, but he, <laughs> as a man of God, as a husband, as a father, uh, the mm -hmm. way he conducts himself, uh, the way he does business, um, it just, it, it, when you, you have conversations with him and, and the wisdom that he can pour into you, he's just one of the top people yeah. that top men that I look at and go, that's someone I want to be like. And so when he, um, made that statement my internal oh the playing the race card or oh it's this person kind of thing it couldn't it couldn't go there because it's like i know this man he's saying this i have a com it's completely different than what i'm thinking there are yeah. things i don't understand and i need to figure out mm -hmm. what is going on and what he's feeling because i could sense the fear i could sense the terror and I could sense the, do you care what's going on in my life? And mm -hmm. so I, um, I don't know if I texted him that day or the next day and I just said, hey, can we get lunch? Because I need to understand what's, what's happening. And to sit down face to face over a meal, um, which I think, I don't know, I just think even when I write with people, um, if I'm writing with them for the first time, 
Um, it, we can't always do it, but I'll try to get breakfast or lunch with them just because I think there's just something sacred about that. And yeah. then you get that time. If conversation's awkward and conversations about race can be very awkward, you know, at least for us say white that, guys, say we that get again. very say uncomfortable. That again, you know? yes. And so, say that you know, if you're eating an omelet, you at least have something to do. But to sit with EJ and to hear him, uh, you know, to see him look me in the eyes and just tell, and I just said, just tell me about your life. Like, what is your life like? And to hear, there was so much, you know, I didn't know. There's so much I didn't understand. There's so much where I was dumbfounded. And, and let me put it in perspective too. Um, I'm a son of a missionary kid. Uh, my parents, my grandparents were missionaries. Uh, Grandpa Smith was the first oral surgeon in Congo. Uh, always wanted to start a Bible college, died before he could. My, my father and my mother, when they went, that was the first thing they did. So not only did they do ministry to black Congolese, they raised up the next generation of spiritual leaders and always saw that they should do that because they would do a better job. The average Congolese speaks five languages. Um, they, you know, have their degrees in, in as far as being pastors and evangelists and so starting churches. And when yeah. the, um, Sorry, this might take a little bit, but I have a point to this. No, it's um, good. When uh, everything hope, happened with the Hutus. Actually, just, just to affirm you, I was hoping you would share this. I'm serious. Okay. Like I was, I was hoping you would give this background. Yeah. Well, when the Hutus and Tutsis, you know, when everything that spilled over in East Congo, but it spilled over into our area and everything that we had was, was pillaged, you know, and they were, claimed, they were trying to claim that my dad was in cahoots with the old dictator, um, you know, and all this stuff. Point being we had to leave like we had to get out of there but every single one of the pastors and the leadership of Laban ministries the bible college they that's their home like they're mm -hmm. there and my dad saw years ago that we need to train these men and women to run everything they need to be able to run it so that if we go back to the states just even for us as a family to be together they know how to do it in 1986 that was a new concept that was not yeah. something that was happening and um you know even we had an orphanage we had 20 kids that you know we and the um african leaders that my dad you know uh hired that they they raised those kids you know we had a dispensary we had no hospital my dad used to fly uh, you know, little boys who might stick their hand, you know, in thinking there was uh, some other kind of animal, a cobra would come out and bite them. And they'd ha he'd have to fly him 15 minutes away, the closest seven hours by truck. Uh, move back here, you know, especially in fourth grade, I thought there were too many white people. I was, I was scared because it was like, there's white people and they're violent. And, <laughs> and so, and so um, you know, and then moving back again, uh, came to Nashville, uh, was part of a uh, church that was uh, cross-cultural, it was about 60-40, um, and under an African-American pastor who ended up marrying Angie and, and myself, he was, he was the pastor who married us. All of that to say, my, my point in this is, it'd be very easy, and it has been, for me to go, I'm not racist. I'm a white guy. I'm a good guy. Look at all the things, you know, when you talk about one of the things I keep hearing is take action. Well, yeah. our family, we've taken action for years without even looking at it that way. You know, it was, we're doing the call of that we think God has called us to, but at the same time, it would be so easy for me to go, I don't discriminate. I'm not bigoted and I have the past to prove it, but I'm here to tell you, I know my heart. And yeah. I am racist. I do have racial bias. I can be bigoted. I can think I'm better. And so for me, it's a thing of going, when EJ is seeing what's going on and he's crying out, why don't I care? Why have I not cared? Why have I not seen that? Why did I not realize that? And I need to understand that better. And the thing that is interesting too about that whole thing is at the end of that, he, there's another friend of mine too, um, who's, uh, uh, we've supported him for a long time, but he raises up the next generation of uh, black believers in mostly historic uh, black colleges. Um, he was saying the same things that EJ was saying. And mm -hmm. so it was like, man, what's going on here? What am I not getting? And in meeting with both of them, 
the thing that was really humbling is at the end of that, they both were like, man, just thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. And I'm like, what? <laughs> You're thanking me for listening <laughs> to hear about what it's, what life has been like for you. And if mm -hmm. I can just share one more thing with, about EJ that really just, it, it gutted me was, um, he, I, I said, you know, the, cause I, I have great respect for the police. So does EJ. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I said, what's it like? And he said, um, he said, man, in the same way that you would pray, is it okay if I share this story? Oh, okay. Man. Um, in the same way that you would pray for God, if you went to a hospital and found out you had a tumor, found out you had cancer with the same fervency that you pray Lord, heal me. Jesus, heal me of this. I pray with that same fervency every time a police car is just behind me, that it's just driving behind me. I pray and I call Janice on the phone. I put her on the speakerphone and, you know, she, she prays over me and we talk through this. And I, I was dumbfounded by that. Cause I, yeah, I get mm. scared, you know, that I'm going to get a, it's going to be two hours. It's going to be a $160 ticket. It's going to be points on my record. It's never crossed my mind ever once that mm. my life might be in danger. And so I was, it made me think, what is life like to where getting to work is a battlefield where it's a struggle where he was like, we've got to kind of have to, we have to plan out like, am I going to go to the gas station? When am I going to do it? Which one? Where? And we, he and Janice, at least back then, talked through conversations I would never have with Angie. So yeah. all that to say, that when you know, you're asking that great question about friendships and why is it important to have friendships, especially with people of, of other races or other colors, it's, it, what, I mean, just a practical thing is to know what their lives are like, to know what mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, and, and when it's friends, it's, much more difficult to push it aside and say, oh, well, that's just that community or that guy is just trying to make money or that person's just doing this. It's like, no, this is EJ. Yeah, this, this is, your is it, This is a guy who I love and respect. I need to listen to what's happening. And oh my goodness, this is what life is like for him. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it really is, it humbles you and it opens you up to go, okay, what can I do better? How can I do things better? How can I love better? And I should care about this because I'm, I claim to be a follower of Jesus. I, I mean, mm -hmm. but for some reason, especially I think for white people, we kind of, you know, it can just kind of be this, no, that was back in the past. We kind of go, well, I hate the KKK too, or mm -hmm. I hated slavery. So I'm not racist. And, and, and all that to say, for people who are listening who are white, if you're listening, this is not a thing of I'm trying to guilt you or shame you because I'm the biggest hypocrite in the room. But it's just to remind you that you can even have my pedigree and you mm -hmm. still have issues of sin in regards to race that you've got to deal with that I have to deal with and look at. So, yeah, man, man, Todd, you, that's bro. Uh, I'm so thankful that you that you shared that and, and EJ I know uh, you know Jason wants you to share it as well but something that you said that I think is, is important that people hear um, you know uh, the the instance where EJ was sharing you know just kind of what happens when the police officer is behind him right and same regard right like man I, I'm thankful for our, our men and women who are who are protecting us who uh, serving their civil duties. I'm so thankful for, for them. And I, I try to let every police officer I know or see, thank you for what they're doing. Um, that's, that's important. Um, but I, I just want to share. So number one, black people aren't monolithic, right? Like we're, we're not all the same, but as you were sharing that about, you know, what he told you, what he processes when there's a police officer behind him, it, we're not monolithic, but at the same time, it's like, man, it's, I shared that that's the same process yeah. I'm, I'm i'm praying and asking god like let this just be a simple ticket let them like go and and drive yeah. by like like all these things and it's like it it just again it shows you just how deep rooted just the 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 sin of racism is in our country and the you know the unfortunate history that you know uh law enforcement has played into some of that uh yeah. to where it's like it's like we know to to fear that or to have this yeah. fear of that um and that's like that's not okay right like we we need to talk about that and maybe 
obviously that's a whole nother conversation for another time. Um, but I just felt like it was important to to share that because um, that's that's real. That's real. Yeah, it's real talk. Yeah, I, I would you know I echo everything Todd has said you know on on the value of this friendship. You know, I mean, he I think when I wrote that, and I do I mean I vaguely remember, and I hate to say it, it's like I don't I I this is going to sound stinging, but this should I vaguely remember who was killed that time if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I just know that. I know when he says Ferguson, I'm like, oh, okay. And then I remember a name and I remember the circumstances. And it was around the same time as I think um, Philando Castile being being shot on Facebook Live and Mm -hmm. just this overwhelming like exhaustion. And um, at the time I just thought, okay, I go to a predominantly white church. I'm working as an attorney with predominantly white clients. My office is all white. My neighborhood is all white. Now, these are people who love me. These are people who would kill for me. These are people who would never think that I am those guys. But I at home and with my wife or with my, 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 my family and my siblings and my friends from high school, we all think I'm those guys. So I realized there's a disconnect because I readily identify with these black guys who are getting murdered yeah. and no one in the white communities that I'm around would ever think that I'm that guy. And so let me connect the dots for them and let, the, let me acknowledge for them why I get scared, why I get on you know, speakerphone when I see a cop. Let, them, let me acknowledge how I have to plan out the time of day that I take my trash out. I don't take my trash out at night. I'm not going to go out of my neighborhood at dark, in the dark ever. I'm never going to do that unless I have to. Um, and let me connect that. And when I did, a lot of people responded. Todd was one of the ones who was rocked, you know, and <laughs> like he said, he was rocked. And we did, we went, we went to, um, to eat and it was just the most beautiful opportunity to just talk about who we are. Now I had already known Todd was the, the, the child of missionaries. I knew he had been in the Congo. I knew that he was, was raised there. I knew that he had been around people with melanin in their skin. Um, but I also knew how deep rooted the conditioning of America was. And I knew that there was no possible way to unhinge any of us black people, white people, Hispanic people, Native American people, to unhinge us of our bias. We are inundated on a regular basis with lies. Uh, My wife says uh, in her diversity training, she teaches on diversity at our church and around other places. And she says, she doesn't believe that there's, that there are racist people, that that people are racist. She believes that racism is is, um, a construct and it's, it's based on lies. And we can perpetuate racism, um, but that we're not necessarily walking around as racist. And a large part is because it's her attempt of defanging that that word. It is so um, insidious and so, uh, you know, like conversation ending that she says, you know what, let's do this. Let's talk about perpetuating racism. And at the end of the day, all of us have the ability to perpetuate racism. If racism is a system that, that is based on lies, we can all do things that enforce the lie or that, um, that, that tear down the lie. So we can affect that. But the lie for me and Derek is that, um, okay, well, if there's a white officer behind us, he's more inclined to give us a hard time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if we perpetuate that in every instance and then feed that to children or feed that to other black people, you know, there's a white officers, so you better watch out because you know how they are. We are reinforcing this concept. Now, that concept didn't just come out of thin air. There's actual yeah. legitimate instances that we can point to that say, well, that's an enforced concept. But one, uh, one lie that I talked to Todd about, I think, that I bring up a lot of times just because it's, it's a little more trivial um, and not as heavy is Band-Aids and flesh tone Band-Aids, right? Yeah. Flesh tone are all for white people's flesh. Mm-hmm. So Band-Aid companies or bandage companies are telling us that the norm of flesh is this color. Well, what does that do to someone whose flesh is this color if they hear that mm-hmm. for 30 plus years over and over again? How, how abnormal am I going to feel? How second rate and not thought of will I feel? And if mm-hmm. I feel like the whole of society believes that about me, 
but then tells me, come on, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But all of you think that I'm second rate. All of you have said that I'm not desirable. All of you, all of you, your institutions, the bandage companies even believe, you know, uh, big box stores call it the hair care aisle and the ethnic hair care aisle. Ethnic, yes. Yeah. So I, my stuff isn't in the hair care aisle. I got to go to the second rate down the, that row and around the corner for the people like you. Mm -hmm. That's Target. That's not like... Store, that's stores, have, <laughs> stores have hair care aisle? Yes. <laughs> I know that you don't, know, don't know that, but there's a I mean, thing Todd, called Todd, hair care aisle for when you got Todd, hair. Todd and I are over here totally engaged, like serious. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you say hair care aisle, and we're like checked out. We're like, Lost. what? Lost. what? Lost. Right. Well, and here's Sorry. what's interesting. My about bad, that. my bad. Comic really because, but because, but even for real, it's important what you're saying. No, Go ahead. To that point, the idea that there's that there should be a hair care aisle, what, what does this say to people who don't have hair right now or can't grow <laughs> hair? Like, because at the end of the day, that's another form of privilege. Uh, that's a whole mm -hmm. other conversation. But mm -hmm. um, the, this, this lie that there are classes of people that have value attached to them. So that Todd could come all the way from the Congo and land in this space that immediately has these conversations swirling around him. Now, he knew enough to know based on his experience, yeah. that people aren't safe. That's something that could translate over here, but it's not supposed to translate over here for a white person. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're supposed to feel safe here. Um, mm -hmm. But if you were to spread that lie to your kids, to your girls, and tell them over and over in time, that yeah, white people aren't safe, at a certain point, they would have just believed that. Yeah. That is what's happened generationally for us. And you know, the reality is it hasn't been that many generations since slavery. It's only been one generation since Jim Crow, you know, mm -hmm. I was listening to a speaker today who was talking about, listen, I was alive when black people didn't have equal rights. Like that was yeah. a current thing. Um, and so conversations like that with Todd, where you, where you have found a friend and you can identify at a level where, you know what, I love you. And then everything else is by the way, yeah. that means that we have taken the power away of, from our differences and we found a way to celebrate them. There is a level of grace that we give people that we care about, such yeah. that when I say to Todd, once we're in friendship, once we're in relationship, hey, just so you know, I don't go outside at night because I'm afraid that I'm gonna be shot to death by a neighbor. Mm -hmm. he, his heart is broken when he hears that. And, it, and he would not ever say to me, Psh, you're crazy. You yeah. made that up, that doesn't exist. Because he knows that I'm not crazy, that I don't make things up, <laughs> and that I'm serious about things when I say that. But that's out of relationship that that comes. That's vital. You know, Jesus's model was not, um, um, it, it was not limited to the synagogue. He, did, he wasn't preaching in mass and then off in his, you know, private green room not to be bothered. He was a very one-on-one -on -one relational kind of God. He loved it. That's right. And some of the most beautiful changes that <laughs> If it hurts, say ouch. <laughs> but <laughs> he loves um, he loved those encounters and some of the most beautiful, richest stories that we have that demonstrate the character and heart of Jesus are the one-on-one -on -one encounters, not the huge mass conversations. It's the woman at the well who's like, right. why are you talking to me? Do you know that I'm a black chick? <laughs> Do you know that I'm a Samaritan? Sure. You know? uh -huh. yeah. and, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, you know, and he, uh, but, but with that, he didn't say, I don't even see that you're a Samaritan. I don't even, like, no, I, I know that you're a Samaritan. I want to talk to you about your heart. I want to talk to you about your choices. I want to talk to you about your life. Why are you doing what you're doing? You know, you don't have to do that. Like that is relational. And that's really God's, I think that's God's prescription for change in any, in any regard, but especially in racial change. So good. <laughs> I, I don't even know what to, what to say, how to, how to follow that up, EJ. That was, I mean, for both of you guys, man, I think yeah. just, just hitting on the value of, of, of healthy, not just, not just relationship in you guys' cases, biblical relationship, right? Like you, you guys are able to enter into this, this uncomfortable uh, 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 tension, if you will, um, because of who you are, number one, in Christ. Uh, but then number two, like you're seeing that, like, man, this, if this is my brother in Christ, like I can lean into this uncomfortableness yeah. to kind of dig into the reality of, you know, different worlds and have those different conversations uh, in, a, in a healthy way. I appreciate you guys, guys saying that. EJ, 
let me let me ask you this, man, because obviously you are you are a leader in the music industry, um, and uh, your your company specifically deals with with churches. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what do you think the church should be doing to engage and influence for 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 healthy biblical change, um, but change in general to to take place here here on uh, in our in our country? There's so much to be done. Um, <laughs> you know, at the core of it, and this, you know, my, my views are, are my own. I will, you know, not my company's. Yeah, that's opinion. why I kept saying your opinion. <laughs> this is EJ's um, opinion. I believe that the American church has to lead the charge in repenting. Preach um, I, th that is something that is ours to do. The church mm -hmm. in general, not white church, but the church, the bride of Christ, has the responsibility to show the world how to repent. Um, and there is a stubbornness and an unwillingness to repent in this area that is almost demonic. And I say that because Christians repent all the time. We all repent. The time. We repent. Hey, if, if I did anything to offend you, I don't even know what mm -hmm. I did, but if I did, I repent. I, like that, that happens all the time. I've never seen another issue in all of Christendom where a single person says, I'm not repenting for that, except mm -hmm. race, except mm -hmm. the sin of slavery in America, except the sin of over 400 years of torture, oppression, rape, lynching, and then the effects, systemic effects of that abuse on people today. I have never seen a group of people so militantly and stubbornly opposed to, if I did anything wrong, I'm sorry, as I have with race. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the sheer cringe and the sheer unwillingness should at the very least cause the church to say, why am I saying no? If God calls us to repentance and grace calls us to repentance and I repent about everything, why am I so hell bent literally on not repenting about this mm -hmm. sin? And I think in that tension is an answer, which goes back to the prejudice and the bias. White people don't want to feel like crap. And mm -hmm. I get that. My stepmother is white. All of my friends growing up were white. Some of my best friends today are white. I love my pastor is white. My church members are white. I have incredible relationships with lots and lots of white people. I don't want them to feel guilty. I don't want them to feel bad. I, I actually am heartbroken when they're heartbroken for my racist, uh, racist um, incidents. Hmm. But I do want them to acknowledge you benefit in this country because for over 400 years, people who looked like me were stepped on, beaten, and killed you need to repent of that sin, not because you committed it, but because it is within the DNA of this nation. Mm -hmm. Because every, every, every building that is built is, is existing because of that sin. Every stock market um, dollar is, is generated because of that sin. And every opportunity is, is the byproduct of that sin. That is just, that is, that is our DNA. That's our heritage. We don't have, we don't have a beautiful history. This ain't a, this wasn't a great nation 400 years ago. I don't care what you think. Mm -hmm. If, 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 if your, if your family dinner is full of good food and incredible decorations, but there's dysfunction and hidden sin and abuse all throughout that before the door opens up on Christmas day, that's not a great family. Mm -hmm. Stop acting like everything that was great was so incredible and the stuff that was disgusting we just shove in a closet when company comes over that stuff mm -hmm. needs to be exposed and as the yep. church we are responsible for exposing it and yes. then repenting of it and so i think you know i'm i'm in a i'm in a very very privileged and blessed situation at capital christian music group because i work with some of the most impactful ministries and churches in the world and i'm honored to be able to say very legitimately and honestly, that the leaders of those movements that I work with care deeply about this issue. 
sometimes they're posting stuff on Instagram before I'm even posting it. And I'm like, you said that? You know, Brooke over at Hillsong is like, she's going for it. She's not playing at all. She don't like it. Um, and I'm so, I'm so honored by that. I'm honored by Todd who will use his platform and speak out as, as, as an artist, um, especially when he knows that he has a voice among predominantly white Christians. Natalie Grant and Bernie Herms using their voices mm -hmm. and yeah. risking the loss of followers and the loss of, of fans and, and, and ticket buyers at some point whenever we can leave the house again. Like that's, I need that. I need y'all to, to be the voice and that is the church. You know, that mm -hmm. is the church. So anyway, it's, it's ours to repent, mine collectively. It's not like, okay, white church, you repent for what you did to black church. It, we are the church. We are all collectively repenting for this, but we definitely gonna repent. Yeah, man, that's good. That's good. So I good. love that. When you think about, even think about the etymology of that word, repent, right? Like it, it, it because in its in its origins, it really just simply means rethink, right? Like think a different way. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not saying that's the answer to everything. It's not what I'm insinuating, but it's significant, right? Like we're we're in a moment. Yeah. where we need to rethink our history, rethink reality, rethink the infrastructure that we have imagined as polished and shiny and beautiful, rethink, right? Like, as you said, we need to rethink this mm -hmm. and really get into the heart of, um, and I love how you said that your wife teaches it, you know, and, the, and I get it that it's defanging and she's kind of disarming the people she's teaching. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is, like Todd confessed earlier, I have racist tendencies too. And, and I told the panel this last night, I know if I have racial tendencies and I grew up in a black community as one of three white dudes in my class in elementary school, right? Like, I, like I, if, if I have that, then yes, man, white, then the white person, the average, even the person who's unaware of it, that they may have racial tendencies, is struggling with this big time. And so rethinking is huge. I love that you said that. And I, I think you're right, man. I think repentance is, is, is something as, especially white church leaders need to have a boldness to call us to. Yeah. And, and I hope that they will. I, I, I hope that they will. Let me add um, one quick note, just as a point of, of, of clarification too you know, because I love rethinking. And it's really, it, that is, a, that is I, the visual I always get is rounding out and filling out the story, right? So that mm -hmm. it's good. you see the, the um, my wife uses this great example of a family member that, that she has, um, that she and her brother have a different relationship with. The, the family member was really, really kind to her brother and really not so kind to her. And she would never go to her brother and say, that's the worst family member ever because that's not his experience. But he in turn, out of compassion, wouldn't say it's the best family member ever because that's not her experience. And yeah. so it's really a rounding out. Sometimes great, sometimes not so great. You know, this America, we live in, the, this is the greatest country on earth. I am firmly in belief of that. This is, I, I, I don't wanna live anywhere else. <laughs> and it's got some beautiful things. So it's got some really ugly things. And it can, it can be both. I'm not going to go to a Patriot and I'm not going to go, I have family members who, who serve, I'm not going to go to the graves of our military and say, this is country. Because what? You died for it. It's great. Yeah. And thank you. But I also don't want someone to come to a Black American and say, you should be grateful. You yeah. could have been, <laughs> what I've seen on social media, you could go back to Africa. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, Maybe it's a great country, but also has, you know, a couple places it could be swept up, you know, maybe we can clean it a little bit. It's great, <laughs> got great bones, but maybe it needs a renovation, you know, <laughs> like, and both can exist. And it is that to your point, Jason, is to rethinking or rounding out a, let's fill out the whole story. So we see all of America in its glory, the good, bad, and ugly. And then we can address the ugly and we can address the bad and we can celebrate the good because all of that has, has validity. Well, and, and just to prove your point, I mean, even think about the metaphor that we use all the time to talk about right and wrong. It's either black mm -hmm. or it's white. Mm -hmm. I mean, just even that, that one incident is an incredible example of 
without even maybe meaning to, although I do think the origins of that phrase, they did mean to, in my opinion, but that's my reading and understanding of it. But but even that is a demonstration of, of, of how far this these tendencies and complexities that we've got to round out and rethink yeah. um, have gone. So as we as we as yeah, we move I, to wrap, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, just to add something to what EJ said, I think um, it's really important for the white church or the white evangelical church or white believers that repentance is on the forefront of us moving forward and to have the church. It's always going to be credible because it's this Christ church. But as far as the church here, and, and, and I'm talking to white believers, um, for there to be a real credibility in all the other areas where we are preaching truth, this yeah. is one that needs to be on the forefront of yeah. also where our voices are and where our actions are and where we're forward to have credibility in these other areas mm -hmm. this needs to be a major area of concern you know if we mm -hmm. are putting uh, abortion up at the top of our list yep. you know uh in this with people of color or people in the, in the black community that needs to be at the forefront too and that's not necessarily mm -hmm. something where we've you know that's been way down here whereas well you know, it's, this is a, a major area of importance for us. Uh, when I think of if we made this a sincere, um, uh, if, if sincere repentance and sincere, how do we move forward and walk right with the Lord and walk right in relationship, that would be so powerful to the rest of this yes. country, to the rest of the world, as far as what it would do to show people, man, what's different about them? What's mm -hmm. different about those believers? They will know you're my followers by your love for each other. You know, mm -hmm. if we were to do that, and so I guess I would even say, even to someone who's listening to this, and in particular, you know, a, a white person who's listening to this and looking at me and go, man, you're just, you're folding, or you're just, even if you're probably concerned about souls, you're probably concerned about people coming to faith. And we know that God is the one, the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals that, but he uses us to preach his word and people look at our people. If they saw us leading in particular with repentance on race, I think it would, you would, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong on this. You guys call me out on this, but I, I think you would see so many people drawn to the church because seeing how we are crossing what's uh, an area that's been so divided and divisive and, and wrong. So. Mm -hmm. No, I would, I would co-sign that. I really do think that when we're John, I, I tell our, our launch team, our, you know, uh, plant a church. We, uh, I tell them all the time. I was like, man, when we're John 13 ing each other, uh, that is when people are going to be like, yo, like there's something different because of what our history says. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I think there's a um, 10%. It might be might be a little bit more, a little bit less of our churches in America are multi-ethnic, right? Mm -hmm. um, man, if that number were to grow, people are going to peer in and be like, man, there's something different about about this, especially in light of what's going on right now, right? right? right. Yeah. Like people don't people don't see that. They're not stepping into that, right? Like right. it's 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 the going back to the it's the uncomfortable. But when they see people really living life together, mm -hmm. um, engaging with each other, engaging in the conversation, weeping with each other when, you know, stuff is like, like this is going on, people are going to see that. And they're like, okay, what's going on? So it goes back to what EJ was saying early on. The church has to lead in this, mm -hmm. right? Like there, we, we can't expect, uh, uh, you know, a, a world that are individuals who aren't necessarily following Jesus. If, if Jesus is the, the forefront of reconciliation, exactly. should not his followers be right. the, uh, on the front lines as, as well? We can't, any, any reconciliation without uh, a gospel reconciliation, I would say is not a real reconciliation. It's a, it's a shadow of it, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, like it, it can happen because of common grace, um, but it's still a shadow if, it, if, the, if the love of Christ is not in that. Uh, and we have that, 
we as God's people have that. And we have an opportunity to, to lead into it. So, man, Todd, I think what you said is, is a nail on the head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good. Well, man, as we move to wrap up here, um, although I, I don't want to wrap up, I, I feel like we could keep, we could part two, really keep going. Part, part three, part four. That's right. That's right. We may have a part two, part three, if y'all be open to it. Um, because, and I say that, I don't, I say that jokingly and not jokingly, because I think this is a long haul thing, right? Like we, it really is. I actually, yeah. I actually hope, I actually hope we do have a part three and part four <laughs> in this, because I think, I think it's going to be a long haul thing. Um, but we try, we've been trying to wrap these up by giving our guests a chance just to say, Hey, here's one or two very practical things um, that, that an individual listener right now could act on here. Mm. You know, what, what's something that a takeaway that someone listening right now, my wife's a doer, for instance, she, she tells me all the time, she'll say that I love that message. What do I do? Mm. Right. Like, and, you know, and, and so I, I think, uh, I think a lot of people are asking that question right now. So what, what might be a takeaway or two that you guys would suggest to our listeners? Well, why don't I go first and then EJ, you, you close it out. Um, I think as far as a couple practical things, uh, one, just calling up, if you're white like me, calling up someone who's African-American who you either work with or that you're friends with and um, asking them once I guess we're in COVID right now, so maybe this isn't the most practical thing, but like what me and EJ did, I do think there's something about face-to-face relationship. Um, and again, I, I, I mean, I really do think over a meal, it's also a way of you saying, I'm, I welcome you as an equal into my space, you know, sharing, sharing food, you know, food together and talking together, I think is a very sacred thing. And then also just saying, tell me about your life. Tell me about it, what it's like. Don't go in defensive. Don't go in trying to win a Fox News or CNN argument. Just go in listening and hearing what your friend has to say. On another practical level, I think, you know, one of the things I'm hearing is please research, please get educated, please learn more, find out more. And so uh, Jamar Tisby's The Color of Compromise um, has uh, I've been listening to it on um, Audible, and there's several other books too, but that one in particular, I love history, and he's such a historian, and so he kind of goes, he goes through basically the past 400, 500 years, and just really chronicles uh, how long this evil has been going on, and what's happening, and what systems were set up, how things move from this to this, going from slavery to Jim Crow, to this, to the, I mean, there's just been one thing after another that I just had no idea. And so, uh, I mean, had some idea, but all that to say, I would read, I would start with that book. Um, those would be two practical things for me. Yeah, That's good. those are good ones. And um, uh, mine are practical, but more philosophical, probably in some ways um, than even Jason, you're asking for. One is to, to check biases, check your biases. And that's everyone. Again, everyone has biases. Um, understand the difference between bias, prejudice, and racism. They're not the same. You can be biased and, um, and not be perpetuating racism. Um, a lot of times racism has to have um, a system of power attached to it um, because your biases are just preferences until you can actually enact and influence and affect those biases in, in, in massive ways or systemic ways um, or in ways where you have power over another person. So, but, but understand, learn the difference between bias, prejudice, and racism. Um, I agree with Todd on educating yourself on, on the thing, um, on the news article, on the video where you recoil and think, that's the spot for you to lean into. The yeah, very, the, the very eye roll um, is, is where you, should, you might have a blind spot. And again, we all have blind spots um, and, and that's work to do. But then on the very, very philosophical level, just have grace for people. You know, have, have tremendous heaps of grace for people because no one knows how to do this perfectly. 
you know, Christ was the perfect reconciler. Derek, I love that you even said it because it's like, yeah, that's the model for reconciliation, which is why the church has the responsibility to lead with it. We actually have the answer. We we have the model. How dare we not share it, the blueprint with a dying world yeah. when we know exactly what reconciliation looks like. Um, yeah. But in that, with that, I love that Christ was humble all the way to the cross. There was no arrogance or air or puffed upness about him in his ultimate ability and authority to reconcile. And I think a lot of times black people have to acknowledge in this country that sometimes we are just furious and we want a pound of flesh. And no amount of groveling from a white person is actually going to appease that because we are actually just grieving. We are actually mm-hmm. just hurt. We are actually just tired and we actually mm-hmm. just want to be heard. Mm-hmm. But for white people, it's also, hey, this is not necessarily about you. I have a friend who says it's not your fault, but it's your problem. You didn't cause this, but you do have to deal with it. It's just the yeah. reality. It, it, and, and, and if it feels unfair that you have to bear the burden of that because of the color of your skin, imagine the burden that we have to bear because of the color of ours. Wow. And have grace for one another. That's right. Because if we're going to do this, we're going to do it together. We're all going to have to live on this planet together. We're going to have to live in communities and, and work at jobs together. So if we're going to have to do this together, then we better figure out how to love one another and how to have grace for one another. Man, so that's good. good. That's, that's good. why I let you go last. Cause no, I'm- no. <laughs> you know, you gave me time to think about something because I was going to be like, oh, <laughs> be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> don't tweet. Oh. <laughs> don't don't well, tweet. I mean, that, listen, which is also that, profound, that, actually. I was about to say, like, there's so much. If imagine if we would just stop that. <laughs> oh, for real. <laughs> no, nah, that's good. Well, fellas, uh, we greatly appreciate appreciate your time. Um, yes. You know, it's one of those things where you know you guys are kind of joking around, but man, I would love to continue the conversation again, maybe in the future, um, just to just to see what your friendship looks like how you guys are operating, how you guys are having this conversation uh, offline, right? Like when it's not recorded, uh, when you guys are literally uh, in each other's homes and breaking bread together, man, uh, that's, that's what we want um, for, for ourselves, for our listeners. And so we want to say thank you for, for coming in and, and modeling that, uh, giving some steps. So um, listen, for, for, our, for, our, for our listeners, um, you know, we always want to give them an opportunity to find out how they can, how they can follow you guys if you're on social media. Uh, EJ, I know you're on on Instagram and and Twitter. What's what's your handle on Instagram and Twitter? At EJ Gaines, E J G A I N E S on Instagram. Nice, nice. Yeah. Any any website or anything that anyone can can you find know, you, you can on? Go to Motown Gospel to see um, the artists that we're working with, but most of the most of my um, musings about coffee and other things um, are going to be on Instagram. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. I'll 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 hit that follow. <laughs> Todd, what about you, brother? Uh, on Instagram, that's probably where I'm most active. It's uh, it's offic- at official Todd Smith. Uh, even though I'm not verified yet, I'm trying to get verified. <laughs> uh, you can find me there because I was at Todd Smith online and my kids were giving me such a hard time that that's super outdated. So, uh, But yeah. all that to say, at official Todd Smith, called Sela, so people can uh, follow us. We still are at Sela online, so you can uh, follow us there too. Nice, nice. Excuse we appreciate it, fellas. Well, thank you guys again for, for joining in on the, the Recon Combo. Remember, you can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter uh, under uh, at the Recon Combo. You can also stay connected with us through our website, reconciliationconversation.com, or feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel under No More Night Media. Alongside my friend Jason Dukes, my name is Derek Delane, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you next time. Peace out. For real.